<laughs> yeah, I, 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 um, I would like to take a moment for all our golden ages to stand up, please. I'd like to recognize her. Like I said, the fact that we call them golden and not the O word. <laughs> they are certainly wise beyond their years and the foundation of our congregation and our church, and they keep us going. Um, so if you would, go in ages after, after the uh, service, remain in the, in, the, in the sanctuary, and then come up for a picture afterwards, and we'll have you get in. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, one other thing I remind you of this morning is uh, we are fast approaching the time to elect new members of council. And there are sheets out in the narthex and attached above the bulletin boards downstairs that list all those people who can be voted for. If you do not want that train to come through your living room, you need to scratch your name off either on a list in the narthex and give it to the ushers or off one of those on the bulletin board so that you will not appear as one of those who can be voted for on election day. I was given very strict instructions on that. Say, so, um, most of you won't do that and we appreciate it. Um, yeah. One sad note today, uh, Brian West father, Reverend Allen West, passed away this week. His funeral is this afternoon at Jonesville Baptist Church. We want to remember him and all the family um, as they have this time of sorrow this week. Um, so keep them in your prayer.
return when our cries go unanswered? Where do we turn when we feel forsaken and alone? We search for God before and behind us, but God is not there. We search for God above and beneath us, but we're on the way empty. Yet, even now, we will commit ourselves to God. Even now, we will put our trust in the Lord. Come, let us worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have admonished the sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you with false words and deeds. By what we have done, and by what we have done undone, we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for him, for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. Today called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by God's authority, I therefore declare to you the full, the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also be you.
Let's pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us your spirit and faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to what lies ahead, we may follow the way of your commandments and receive the crown of everlasting joy. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? 
No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. The man said to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard will it be for those who have well, to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold more now in this age, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come to eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Storms we just had, you think there's been a lot of Jesus going around, huh? 
Do you see Jesus in the good times? Yes. Absolutely. How many Jesuses can you find in this church? Oh. Everybody look around. Ten. Wait, can we get up? No, there's a point if you see them. There are a whole lot of little Jesuses hidden in the church. And while I'm asking the kids if they see Jesus in their friends or at school or at work or on the road, did you notice Jesus in the church? We have little Jesuses. There's one right there on the piano. Yeah, that's They're in the choir box, too. They're in, the, they're in all the window seals. Did you notice the best one? Did you notice the Jesuses? You didn't notice the Jesus with the hot pink sash that's hidden somewhere where he's not usually? We've got to be on the lookout for Jesus. He's everywhere. So a few weeks ago, our congregation, if you're a visitor, our congregation had the opportunity to heal little Jesus because we all need a little Jesus in our life. So if you're a visitor, please make sure you can, if you can find one today on your way out, you can get a little Jesus too. But just know that Jesus is everywhere that you look for him. He doesn't have to be a little figurine with a pink sash or a yellow sash. He's everywhere and we can find him as long as we look. Pretty hands? Dear God, thank you for always giving us the opportunity to find you in the good and in the bad, on a good day, a bad day, a long day, a short day. And we thank you for always being here with us and in our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Certain fondness for the 
prophets of the Old Testament. I think they have something to teach us. I think they have something meaningful to say to us. And I think, quite often, it's what they have to say to us is stuff we don't want to hear. That's the truth. You can't read Amos today, the passage that we read, and think, wow, he sure is being good to me. Talk about how good I am because he ain't doing that. For the prophets, not always, but in large part, the prophets are aware of the power of sin and the power of that sin to lead people with good hearts to do things they really shouldn't have had to all to do. Now, I'm not talking about little peccadillos and things like that, like that, but it's a watchguard to the very orientation of our lives. And the truth is, the truth it really is, it's very easy to think of ourselves as being up so good and not see the flaws that are in our lives. And favorite better than me, you know. Well, no, I'm just as bad as everybody else, and probably worse than some. That's just the way we are. It's why I think that the story of Adam and Eve is always present in our understanding of the faith because we see there here in the Garden of Eden where life is perfect and it's a paradise and nothing bad ever happens. Something does. And since that time, human beings have needed God's help to negotiate life. And for me, one of the most important things in that story of Adam and Eve that we sometimes forget or gloss over is that when they have been kicked out of the Garden of Eden and life all of a sudden gets tough because sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold, and sometimes the rain isn't gentle, and sometimes the wind isn't a soft breeze, as we all experienced a little over a week ago. The whole of creation got knocked out of sorts, and it hasn't been sorted out yet. And the prophets in the Bible to remind us that the lull and the lure of sin is always there in front of us. Jesus is on the road making a trip. He's walking along and he gets out onto the main road and he starts down there and all of a sudden this young fellow runs up and kneels before him and says, good teacher! What do I have to do to earn eternal life? Well, right there, you know something's not quite right. We know he's not a Lutheran because Lutherans know you don't earn eternal life. It's a gift from God that we receive and then we try and live out here on earth but we don't earn it. As we all know, as good Lutherans, if we have to earn it, it ain't heaven. I don't know what it would be, but it's not heaven. Jesus says, Why do you call me good? The only person who's really good is God. He says, Then God begins, Jesus begins to enumerate to him various Ten Commandments. Not necessarily in their exact order that we find them printed in Scripture. But they're all the ones that govern our relationships with one another. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't bear false witness. Don't, be, don't commit fraud. Honor your father and mother. Of course, my, my favorite one is, uh, of that is, is that it, is, it assumes that mothers and fathers are going to be honorable and deserving of being honorable. We all know that doesn't always happen anyway. But it's all these things that are there to help us negotiate in our lives 
how we live with each other, with husbands and wives, with children, with neighbors, with people with whom we do business, that maybe that is the only point of contact we will have with them in our lives. The only point of contact with somebody may be when I walk in the store and buy something, your only point of contact with me is there when they're working at the cash register to let me pay for it. And yet in all of these things, it is casual, it is ordinary, it is fleeting as they may be, there exists the opportunity to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, well, all you have to do then, you got it, you got it locked. You got everything put up. Every cubicle has got the right thing in it. The alphabet is exactly out in line. You got one to ten in the right order. All you got to do is go sell everything you've got, give it away to the poor and follow me. And the guy, this young man, who was very sincere and serious and wanting to know what he needed to do, decided that the cost was more than he could pay. He had a lot of stuff. It was worth a lot of money. And he wasn't willing to do that. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't have near as much stuff as that young man probably had. But I got enough stuff that I like that I don't necessarily want to just get rid of it and start walking around the streets and sleeping, you know, in alleyways or something like that. That's not for me. I like my comforts. I like a nice bed, clean sheets, nice fluffy pillow, things like that. I enjoy having that stuff, and in some sense, you know, I've worked to have it, and I feel like I deserve it. But boy, I'm just wrong a foul of Amos, haven't I? And of Jesus, too, as you see. Do we balance regular everyday life in the society in which we live, which generally believes that if you work hard and you progress and you make good money, that you deserve what you get and you should have it, as opposed to you know, what Jesus may say, sell it all and follow me. And the kids couldn't do it. It made Jesus sad. And Paul says, how can anybody be saved? And Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. Well, God, you're the time saved, but I'm not rich. I'm moderately well off, but I am not rich. Well, unless you compare me to somebody that lives in the southern half of India or in the jungles of Africa or somewhere in South America, uh, you know, where uh, they hardly have even any paved roads, much less uh, houses with air conditioning. So in the context of the world at large, I was pretty rich. Boy, that can be pretty uncomfortable. People have, through time, tried to take that saying of Jesus, a camel through the eyes of the needle and trying to make it into something that might be a, a little bit less drastic. Uh, they one time said, you know, that, that well, it referred to a little small gate, door in the gates at Jerusalem that you could sneak a person in and out of when it was besieged, and that if you had the right size camel and it could get down and crawl on its knees, it could get through there. The only problem is there's no evidence in history at all that such a gate or opening ever existed. I think Jesus meant it to be just as absurd as he said it. I highlight the fact that when you got a lot, it's hard to get saved. It's hard to begin to gravitate to what we've got instead of what we need. The real need the relationship with God. So boy, we are just all lost, aren't we? Because there ain't anybody in here that's really desperate or who's thrown away everything that they could have ever had to wander around and standing on the street corner yelling at people about Jesus. Paul says, I mean, Paul, Peter, 
got Paul on the brain because they're teaching Paul in proclamation of Peter this morning. Peter says, Who can be saved? Really? And he's not asking that as a joke or as sarcasm or anything like that. He is completely dumbfounded and he is honestly wondering who can be saved. Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. With God, salvation can occur. With God, we are not without hope. And that kind of turns the tables on everything that we've talked about. Before. Doesn't mean that they're not right. And it doesn't mean that we've got it out, but what it does mean is that in Jesus Christ, who walked among us as one of us, who was raised up on a cross and died, who was buried in a tomb, who rose three days later, and then 40 days after that ascended into heaven, through Jesus Christ, everything is wrong with our lives, every place when we've turned away from what God would want us to do, we never have been outside of hope in God. God's hope is our hope. God's love brings us into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ that overcomes all the waywardness in our life. On that statement, with God, all things are possible. There hangs our salvation. There hangs eternal life. There hangs hope always for us everyone else. In Christ, God acts decisively for our salvation. One of my favorite verses. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that through him the whole world might be saved. That's what God wants for all of us. That's what God wants for the world. I don't think I'm in a position to tell God what he can and can't have. That's what God wants. Maybe God gets it just the way he said it. But it doesn't excuse us from at least putting forth the effort to live by Christ's teachings. Read the prophets. And as hard as it may be to hear what they say, take them and examine our lives, our institutions, our society and say, could we make it closer to what God wants than what we want? Amen.
faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share that peace.
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>